Good morning. This is uh, the Vermont um, Legislature, a joint meet. It is uh, January 13th, uh, Wednesday. This is a uh, joint meeting between House and Senate committees. I am Representative Ann Pugh. I chair the House Human Services Committee, and our committee is joined by the uh, House Health Care Committee, um, and as well as the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. <clears throat> uh, we will be um, focused uh, today, um, beginning our three, our, our, our three session joint meetings um, around uh, focusing on the response um, to COVID and uh, as well as what we need to do uh, going forward. Uh, before we take testimony, um, it probably makes sense since this is the first time all of us have gotten together um, if we introduce ourselves to each other, because at least on mine, we are over two, um, um, over two screens. Um, might I suggest, um, when, with all deference to our to our Senate colleagues, um, that we start with the Senate, um, and then uh, Representative Lippert, if your committee would introduce themselves. I don't know if there is an order that you all have, um, and then we can end up with House Human Services introducing ourselves as we have in the past using, we'll start with um, uh, the, uh, the vice chair and then go around the table. Senator Lyons, if you would like to start. Sure, good morning, uh, Senator Jenny Lyons, and I chair the Health and Welfare Committee in the Senate. And I will now turn it over to our vice chair. Um, Senator Lyons, perhaps you might, just because we're also introducing ourselves to each other, um, you might say where you're the senator from or something. Yeah. Oh, I'm happy to do that. I, I represent Chittenden County District. And um, that's good. And if you would like further information, let me know. Thanks. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's nice to see so many faces on the screen. I'm Ruth Hardy. I'm uh, the Senate Health and Welfare Vice Chair, and I'm also brand new to the committee. So it's very exciting to work on these issues during a pandemic. Um, I am from Addison County, and I live in East Middlebury. And good morning. I'm Senator Cheryl Hooker from Rutland County. I live in Rutland City, and I'm also new to the committee, so looking forward to working on all of these important issues. Josh? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Senator Josh Taranzini from Rutland County. Uh, nice to see everyone today and meet so many of you. Uh, I am new to the Senate, and I look forward to uh, working with my uh, very talented uh, committee, and uh, I wish everyone a great day. Senator um, Taranzini, is your father in the a house? Depends, who, depends who's asking, uh, Representative Pugh. <laughs> but yes, he is. Yes, uh, most of you know Representative Taranzini, who is my father, so. Well, we have, I, I have a soft spot for people who have connections to the house, um, such as Senator Hooker, who uh, served in the house. Senator, yeah, uh, Representative Pugh, we all have close connections. You have muted. You've gotten I'm muted. sorry. I didn't want to mute that comment. We all feel very connected to the House. <laughs> <laughs> Why Representative, I was going to say Representative Pugh is becoming a bit of a family business for us Terranzini. So. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, Representative Lippert. Okay, was that everyone from the Senate committee? No, we're missing one more, please. Um, oh. There was one other, yeah. actually. Yeah. yeah, I'm Senator Ann Cummings. I'm, other than the chair, the one returning member to the committee. I think that makes me the senior. Um, I represent Washington County. I live in Montpelier. And my daughter was recruited, but did not run for the house. <laughs> okay. So shall I go, Representative Pugh? 
Yes, uh, Re Re Representative Bill Lippert, uh, I live in Hinesburg and I chair the House Health Care Committee. And I'll turn it over to our vice chair. Representative Ann Donahue uh, from Northfield, vice chair. Representative Houghton, I'm ranking member from Essex Junction and I'll turn it over to Brian Chena. Hello, I'm Representative Brian Chena from Burlington, Vermont, and I'll turn it over to Woody Page. Hi, I'm Woody Page. I'm from Newport. I represent uh, Orleans District 2. And I actually sit to the right of Representative Terenzini, but I'm not, I'm not making a political statement on where I sit. <laughs> but uh, he's a very good seatmate. Thank you. Would you pass it to another committee member, Woody? Oh, yes. Yes, I'll uh, pass it on to uh, uh, Representative Cordes. Thank you. Thank you, Woody. Mari Cordes from Lincoln, Addison County. This is my second term in house health care. <laughs> Elizabeth? Hi, I'm uh, Representative Elizabeth Burroughs. I live in West Windsor and represent Windsor 1. I'm going to welcome, well, I'll just go, Leslie, I'll just cue people at this point, yeah. Thank you, that's really helpful. Uh, Leslie Goldman from Rockingham, I represent Wyndham 3. Okay, and I have to check my screen quickly. I think, uh, Art, are you here? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Uh, I'm Art Peterson, first uh, term guy. I uh, live in Clarendon, represent Rutland District 2. Okay, and... Uh, Alyssa, are you here? I am uh, Representative Alyssa Black. I live in Essex and I represent Chittenden 8-3. And I think that's all of us. Uh, Representative Long is not with us this morning. Am I missing anyone on our committee? I don't think so. But no. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Pugh. Thank you. Um, Representative Wood, would you start us off? Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Representative Teresa Wood. I live in Waterbury and represent the Washington Chittenden District. Representative McPon. Good morning. Uh, I'm Representative McFawn. I represent Barrytown. I'm um, Representative Jessica Brumstead and I represent Shelburne and St. George. This is my second term on House Human Services, but my third term in the State House. I'm Representative Mary Beth Redmond. I serve Chittenden 8-3, or sorry, Chittenden 8-1, um, and I am from Essex. Representative Payala, I live in Londonderry, and I represent the Wyndham-Bennington-Windsor District. Representative James Gregoire, I live in Fairfield. I represent Fairfield, Fletcher, and Bakersfield. Good morning, I'm Representative Dan Noyes. I live in Wolcott, and I represent Wolcott, High Park, Johnson, and Belvedere. Um, Representative Rosenquist, are you here? Car Carl Rosenquist, representing the town of Georgia. I'm sorry. Hi everyone, I'm Representative Taylor Small, um, here in Winooski, representing Winooski and a sliver of Burlington. Hi everybody, uh, Representative Dane Whitman, uh, Bennington District 2-1, glad to be here. Um, I think that's great, and just for folks to, to know, we do not yet have the commissioner um, here, and so um, Senator Lyons, you had some uh, thoughts that you wanted to, to bring out in terms of what your committee is hoping for out of, to, uh, out of uh, today's meeting. And I don't know, Representative Lippert, if you might also, as we chart, figure out what we're going to do in the next hour and a half. Uh, so thank you, Representative Pugh. This won't take long. We did spend some time this morning just uh, thinking about what we would like to hear from the commissioner. First, um, how the CRF funding was utilized during the, the last stage. Uh, is, is there sufficient PPE now? Uh, and what resources 
does the Department of Health need or are they under-resourced in any way for the work ahead? What are the needs going forward? What will we have to do around budget adjustment, if anything, to help? Is there, are there sufficient resources for vaccinations? What about long-term care facilities? I'm just sort of shorthanding everything that we uh, talked about. Long-term care facilities in places like um, our corrections institutions where people are together and the question around vaccinations. What testing accessibility is there? Is there sufficient testing going forward? What more do we need? Uh, questions about distribution of vaccine and testing. So trying to sort out where, just generally, where are we with uh, what we have or what we don't have? Where are the gaps? Uh, there was a question about our uh, National Guard going abroad and whether or not those folks are receiving the type of protect protection that they need when they first go to Florida and then uh, go out, out of country. Questions about uh, whether or not how, whether the Department of Health is engaged in supporting folks with substance use disorder, mental health issues during COVID. Um, we did have questions about the money that's not obligated at currently through the last CRF. How much is that and what are the needs that Department of Health might have? So that is, that's an ongoing discussion and I think it links in with budget adjustment as well as uh, other areas. The biggest area I think was on vaccines, as you well know, uh, the concern that we've heard from our constituents, who goes first, um, who's second and so on. Do we have sufficient uh, vaccine available for the people in our state? Then another concern on the medical effects of vaccines, the side effects and that some people are very concerned and perhaps discouraged uh, about the vaccine as a result of hearing about side effects. So that's a short list of things that we discussed this morning. And um, just to prime the pump a little bit so that as we're listening, if we don't get answers to these questions today, because I know it's going to be a, a time for listening, then this will give us an opportunity to circle back and um, get greater detail. So that, that's, that's some of it. That, that helps to, for what in terms of we will keep our eyes and ears to listen to. I also wonder if some of the that discussion we might information we might get in subsequent uh, testimony tomorrow and the day after. Um, yes, the following no, week. yes, we're very aware of that, particularly the mental health, uh, substance use disorder, and long term care facilities. So um, we'll just leave it at that. Thanks. Yeah, and I think that I think that tomorrow we're focusing on the use of CRF dollars uh, in particular. So that maybe that. Given that, given that short, long short list, Senator Lyons, uh, <laughs> that uh, we may not we may not be able to cover it all today. I would just say that uh, one, we did not spend time particularly looking ahead in the way that your committee did, uh, but I know that there are many questions that have been raised, uh, or questions are being raised about uh, who's in line next around the vaccine, and I think it would be helpful from my point of view uh, for us to give the department a chance to explain. Uh, how they are, uh, how they are coming to their decision making and conclusions in terms of uh, what they've done in terms of access to vaccines. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to just step out on a limb here. I think um, I would love if it's possible for us to also uh, express some appreciation uh, to Dr. Levine and the Department of Health and their staff who have, have been uh, incredible in my view uh, throughout this uh, pandemic so that I, I and Representative Pugh, I realize you, you will take the lead on this, but uh, I think there's so much to be appreciated in terms of where we are as a state and the leadership that, that uh, Dr. Levine and others have provided. So hopefully we can get a chance to express that. Um, absolutely, and uh, Representative Lippert, I was sort of um, thinking of starting welcoming um, Dr. Levine and expressing our appreciation and our thanks and our undying um, gratitude to him and to the staff. Um, are you, um, 
suggesting that both you and uh, Senator Lyons have an opportunity to say that, to um, to say that as well. Would you like that as well? Well, uh, however however it emerges is fine. I just I'm happy to have you express it on our behalf. But to make yeah, to I I agree. I mean, we we have limited time with him, and the more he can be speaking, and the less we're intruding, I think the yeah. better. Um, we are. Um, no surprise, he is a man who is um, uh, very busy and who is being pulled in many directions. He is not, uh, he has not yet come um, on board yet. So we have some more opportunity to, uh, to have a conversation amongst our three committees. Um, Senator Lyons, you, um, you have the you and your committee members have the opportunity and the luxury. You may not see it as a luxury of um, interacting with both um, health, house health care and uh, house human services. Um, as we um, in the house side, we share uh, we share many things as it relates to health with uh, with um, the health care committee focusing. Um, and primarily, I mean, not to say that we don't, you know, with healthcare um, and uh, with um, the Human Services Committee um, in the, that area being more focused on what I might call public health and the social determinants of health as opposed, you know, um, but of course being overlapping. So you get to do twice the work that uh, Representative um, Lippert's uh, committee and, um, as well as House Human Services. Um, and I imagine this year that the three, our three committees will work together as well as we have in past years. Well, you know, I think our committee looks forward to that. Uh, we were so productive last session by working together and consolidating our efforts. Uh, I think it's a continuum, just as we talk about a continuum of care, from the medical to the public health and social services, I think uh, we are we are very interested in staying connected with both committees. And I, even though we work twice as hard and get half the pay, I, we're mm -hmm. we're very pleased to do that. <laughs> uh, Senator Hooker, um, just on a rather somber note, uh, recognition that today marks the tenth month that we left the state house. And it's kind of um, sobering to think of that. And when we think of all of the work that's gone into uh, navigating through this pandemic, it certainly, Representative Lipper is appropriate for us to thank Dr. Levine and all those who've had a part of that. But 10 months, it's yeah. incredible. And if, if I may, Representative Pugh, uh, also, that, that reminds me, I was about to say this, but it is 10 months since we worked so collaboratively between our three committees to do emergency pandemic, emergency COVID legislation uh, that we, uh, I think, it, you know, as you say, we left the state house uh, having already taken initiative to set in motion emergency COVID legislation, which we moved through our uh, both of our bodies. And uh, one of the things we met, talked about in our committee this morning was uh, the need and desire uh, for all three of our committees to review uh, what we did in terms of those emergency COVID uh, pieces of legislation and to see if there's any updating, extensions, et cetera, that we need to be doing. So that I just, that that's not necessarily our major agenda here with Dr. Levine this morning, but it's certainly a, a, an important top of mind joint uh, agenda for our three committees as we, as COVID really is our primary and initial focus uh, mm -hmm. going into this session. So, oh, thank I you, couldn't, that, thank yeah. you, Senator Hooker for that reminder. That's, that's. Right, it's a dire reminder, um, but we've, we, um, we've been lucky and we've also been very uh, fortunate to have the Department of Health that we have. Mm -hmm. and the, and the uh, people listening to a science-based decision-making. Um, I do want to go back and circle back very briefly um, around 
what our concerns were about the CRF funding that we've just been through. And that I guess the, the, the key question is, does the Department of Health have the resources that it needs currently and going forward? And that relates as much to the money as to the, um, just the, the stamina and the support services that it might need. So mm -hmm. I wanna emphasize that. That was, uh, I forget who made that recommendation. We have such a good group. They're all making great recommendations. So came from, came from the whole committee. It's, it sounds like a, a, a very important question to have the, um, the answer to. Um, I, 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 might I might suggest that, that we ask it in a slightly different way um, because- you're, you're in charge. Okay, um, and <laughs> when I say that, when I say that more in terms of um, what is it that you or a public health, you know, a health department needs to adequately and sufficiently respond. Um, and then we can ask what they have. Um, I guess part of my, um, it, it may be challenging to say you don't have enough. That's all. And, and I'd just be curious as to, you know, what would be the gold star? I mean, I think we have a gold star, but what would be the, um, the, the ideal set of um, factors for a public for, for a response. Good. Um, I'm going to ask legislative council or not, um, or Julie or anyone if we have any ETA. For um, Madam Chair, this is Julie. I'm checking with his assistant. Okay. Um, I want to just make sure it is my understanding that if if need be, and I don't know, we um we have the we have this time until twelve thirty. Um, that we went a little bit over twelve. Um, some people I know have um, other commitments. And Re Representative um, Lippert is looking at me as if this is total news. Oh. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm being reminded if I had known it beforehand. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, and I also I, know- I think, there was a, I think there was an early discussion about that, but it's frankly slipped my mind. Oh. Dr. Le Dr. Levine is currently in the governor's press conference. <laughs> okay, is it? I thought that was. Uh, Madam Chair, what I knew about was he was at a Chamber of Commerce meeting until 1030 and then would be joining us. So <laughs> news. Oh, no, um, Representative Cordes, uh, I'm sorry, um, a mistake. <laughs> um, perhaps looking at something, I was like, oh my heavens, we're really having lots of press conferences now. Um, it's Wednesday. There should be no press conferences on Wednesday. Right. Right. So can we, perhaps while we're waiting, just to recap what our plans are for tomorrow, and then uh, I think we're, we're together again next Wednesday, I believe, um, that what we've talked about today. And do you mind, Representative Pugh, if I just quickly go over that? I think that then tomorrow we really are focused uh, more on the, the use and the impact of the CF, CRF dollars that we uh, allocated last year. I think we're going to start tomorrow at, are we starting at nine tomorrow? Is that, is that my memory? Is that correct? Yep. yep. We're starting at nine tomorrow and we have uh, and, and we're here, a here very from, uh, extensive list of folks testifying Right, but we're going to start with uh, the yeah. Agency of Human Services and uh, Sarah Clark, who's their chief financial officer, or chief COO. I'm not sure what her actual title is. Am I correct? Uh, we'll yep. be hearing from her and then other constituent groups. Yeah. 
So uh, just, just to remind folks that, um, and I'll say this again tomorrow morning, but this is a very packed agenda. We're all gonna wanna hear much more than we're getting. And there's uh, Commissioner oh, Levine in the waiting room and I'm, I'm gonna look, there he comes, okay. Fabulous. Good morning, Commissioner. Oh. Um, good morning. Good morning, welcome and thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, uh, Commissioner, as you, um, as you are aware, you are um, uh, testifying in front of three committees we are trying to be somewhat respectful um, of your uh, time by and not asking you to say the same thing to three different committees. So you are um, testifying in front of Senate Health and Welfare, uh, House Human Services, and House um, Health Care. Um, and uh, today I get to be the facilitator and Senator Lyons and um, Representative Lippert will um, jump in when I make a huge mistake or things like that or miss something. Um, but before I turn it over to you, I, want, I, I really want to say publicly on behalf of, um, in particular, our three committees, um, but really on behalf of the legislature and the people of Vermont, thank you. Thank you. Thank your staff. Um, Thank your calmness, your focus on science, what you all, what your team has put together has, um, has challenging over the past 10 months. We were reminded that this is 10 months um, that we have um, been in this place um, and what you have um, spearheaded, what you have been um, the lead on in terms of moving this state, in terms of addressing and dealing with um, this pandemic is nothing short of incredible. Um, and um, our, this, the results, even though they're, um, the, the results at, in comparison to what the rest of the country is, I think speaks to you and the leadership um, that you have provided and the incredible um, work that your staff has done, leaving their existing jobs to really focus on this. So thank you very much, Commissioner. Well, thank you for the kind words. Uh, I wish we could just put the check mark in the box and say we're moving on to the next item uh, and talk about the things we used to talk about uh, with your committees, but uh, we'll get there. We, we have a ways to go. Um, in communicating with Julie Tucker, it sounded like your, the, the emphasis you'd like me to take this morning is very much in the vaccine arena. Is that totally well, correct? Or are there other things you want me to uh, preface the vaccine discussion with regarding anything? <laughs> um. We probably have an agenda that would take three weeks. Um, um, in terms of some specifics, yes, vaccines, the vaccine rollout, um, is there enough, how you're making the decisions and perhaps the differences in um, um, who is getting them um, in terms of issues of equity is, is of course issue. Um, but then there is, you know, everything from, what does, um, what does the health department or what does a health department need? What do you need in order to, um, to respond for the state to respond um, sufficiently um, to this, whether it's in terms of PPE, whether it's in terms of vaccines, whether um, it's in, ter you know, in terms of um, testing, so there's all of that kind of um, piece. Uh, and this is, this is your first opportunity to um, share with us um, the response. And I'm gonna look to Senator Lyons and 
um, Representative Lippert, if they wanted to add. I, listen, I, I thank you, Dr. Levine, for being here, but I'm not interested in adding at this point. Uh, I think there's enough on that plate. So I, you know, I just look forward to hearing what the commissioner has to say. Yeah, let me let me second that uh, again. Uh, welcome, Dr. Levine, and uh, we'll let's let's start let's start with what Representative Pugh has outlined, and then uh, I'm sure we'll be able to pick up things from there. Sure. And um, in terms of time allotment, um, I'm not going to get carried away and talk for hours, but you know how much time I should talk versus the Q and A portion of this. I almost want to say talk as long okay. as you want. Um, I'm looking at um, uh, Senator Lyons and uh, Representative Lippert, but um, we could spend three hours with questions. Um, and yeah. I think on some level, what we need is information um, okay. first. Okay. Um, and, and we have, just to let you know, I don't know what you have. We have um, until 1230. If that, if need be, I don't know what your time constraint is. Yeah, I was listed as uh, twelve fifteen on my screen. Okay, so. okay, that works. So that works for us. Thank you. Okay, um, so I'll have a few slides that I'll bring in later on if I can actually finesse the sharing part. Um, doesn't always work well, <laughs> but um, let me do without slides for the uh, for the beginning. I'll talk a little bit about where we are right now, you know, before we get to vaccine, uh, where we are right now in the pandemic, why is it different now than it was before? Um, and how do we get back to where we felt more comfortable? So I think everybody's aware that um, if you just watch any news network in the morning, it's just shocking what's going on around the country. You know, 4,000 plus deaths yesterday setting a new record. Hospitalizations every day setting a new record. Uh, numbers of cases obviously setting new records. Um, uh, and using the color red, which is sort of what the maps usually look like on the COVID tracking kind of websites, you know, the country is a sea of red. And then you have this little island in there called Vermont, which sometimes looks orange, sometimes looks um, yellow or green in the past, uh, but markedly different than the rest of the country. And even if you look at the New England region, our numbers of cases are certainly surging ahead. Our numbers of hospitalizations, especially in the Southern New England states are doing really horrendously where their system is actually being stretched to capacity. And uh, deaths variable, but certainly not a pleasant statistic anywhere. Um, <clears throat> I, I have to say that Vermont has joined that movement, but in a much lesser way, uh, which is great. Um, but certainly, you know, we're not used to the numbers of deaths we've been having in our state. Um, and uh, yesterday at the press conference, I mentioned that. We are now at a new high in hospitalizations, though we're nowhere near close to threatening the capacity of our healthcare system uh, or feeling uncomfortable about where we are at that point. So everybody knows we spent the majority of 2020 um, contending with this new novel virus, but in a pretty good place when it came to our numbers of new cases on a daily or weekly basis our percent positivity of our tests. Um, and certainly our hospitalizations and deaths were almost negligible. Um, I like to think that most of that is because we have a state that does prioritize health. Its citizens prioritize health. We always rank number one or two or three in the different metrics that people use to say, who's the healthiest state in the country? It's a good place to start when you start encountering a pandemic to have a population who believes in all of that. Um, and then the cooperation and collaboration and compliance of everybody in Vermont has been of an estimable help in us getting to where we've gotten to. 
In addition, we continue to, but always began with the premise that this virus is like a little bit of natural selection. It chooses the most vulnerable. And if you let it get into the most vulnerable populations, you will have very bad outcomes. So we tried from the start to protect our elders, those in congregate living situations. Uh, we had very restrictive visitation policies. We had policies that regarded testing in those facilities, how to deal with new admissions and quarantine in those facilities. We created, unfortunately, a fair amount of mental health issue on the part of those living there, as well as those who wanted to visit them. Um, but we protected and preserved life uh, for sure. I won't spend a lot of time on what we've done in terms of how we got to the stay home, stay safe, and then how we opened up the economy and the uh, various sectors in our state over the course of the year, except to say that it was done only after a sufficient degree of viral suppression had occurred. And then when it was done, it was done very slowly and deliberately and in a phased pattern so that we always could have one incubation period of virus, which is 14 days, to watch what the impact of our previous move was before we move to the next move. And I think that was very, very critical uh, as part of that effort. So um, that's sort of a, a summary of where we were through most of the year. And then as you have noticed, cases have increased here to numbers we've never seen before. Not that they've spiraled out of control, but they're certainly higher than ever, as are our hospitalizations and deaths. Most of that is due to the transition in the season. Uh, we're now indoors more uh, naturally, and it would make people want to congregate together more in unhealthy ways because they can't be spread out like they might be out of doors. We also had several major holidays, starting with Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's Eve, all of which have their own independent impact on the case rates uh, that we've seen. We also have this phenomena of called pandemic fatigue, which is real and it's apparent and it's understandable. Um, and it takes a lot of rallying to get people back into a rhythm where they can appreciate that again and hold on just a little bit longer, so to speak. Uh, so that's very, very important. But I want people to understand a little bit about the strategies we've used during 2021 and the latter part of 2020 that were different than what we did in March and April where we shut down the state and had a stay home, stay safe posture. Now we feel very confident we can be, as it's sometimes termed, more surgical, more strategic in our approach. We had data that supported getting, uh, putting the travel map on pause and markedly um, uh, enforce, not enforcing, but you know, trying to get people to abide by our quarantine criteria because we knew travel was a big, big threat to the health of our state. We also knew that even modest sized gatherings were a huge contributor and would become even a more vibrant contributor with the holidays to um, disease in Vermont. Those are the two things we prioritized as we began to look at uh, how to manage ourselves in this critical time period. You'll notice there was not a lot of change in retail or in other commerce. There was not a lot of change in schools or child cares, which by and large have remained open. And though there are cases sporadically, they've done quite well. There wasn't a huge change in the lodging industry except that of course travel restrictions impaired their ability to have as good a business and the lodging industry itself was not the site of major cases as the year went on. There were subtle changes in the restaurant business and certainly closures of bars. Uh, but again, in Vermont, as opposed to other parts of the country, not major places where we saw cases. And you'll note, we still allow one-on-one -on -one contact, whether it be a healthcare setting or a barbershop or a hair salon. And we still allow people to go to fitness centers and gyms uh, that are abiding by all of the guidance we provide. 
because again, these are not where cases happened in Vermont. Um, so a very surgical approach to uh, a, a significant problem. What we're seeing now uh, is a little hard to predict uh, because hospitalizations and deaths lag behind as indicators, the numbers of cases. But we're seeing cases not taking off necessarily. You know, we've made it through the 14 days post Christmas. We're just about now 14 days post New Year's. Um, so we're watching very closely to see if there's any further impact. But if we can kind of hold our own where we are, that would be very, very favorable and markedly different than a lot of what surrounds us. Uh, and that indeed would be a goal. In addition, we um, will be watching this hospitalization rates very, very closely uh, and the ICU beds, especially because on our Eastern border with Dartmouth and on our Western border with some of the UVM health network like Plattsburgh, uh, those places are unable to take a lot of new admissions. They're unable to take transfers with higher acuity problems. Um, and that means many of our Vermont patients who would have gone to Dartmouth or many of our Vermont patients who would go to the UVM Medical Center will now be uh, a little harder to get them out to Dartmouth and a little harder to get them to UVM if a lot of the New York State business is coming into the uh, Academic Medical Center. So we have to watch those numbers very, very closely um, because they are having surges on both of those borders. With regard to deaths, <clears throat> We've seen a little bit of a tapering off, if you will. Um, it's really a race to get vaccine into the long-term care facilities quickly enough and get them immunized. Um, immunization is not a strategy to deal with the pandemic in terms of an outbreak, but it is a strategy to deal with our future and prevent future deaths. So that's kind of how we're looking at all of that. Now to move us to, to sort of where we are in the world of vaccine, um, because that's what's really on everybody's mind and has taken over as uh, the primary consideration. Um, let me sort of divide this into categories. Um, first of all, until further notice, we are completely at the mercy of the federal government when it comes to how much vaccine we will have to deliver. Everyone knows we have phase 1A, which is the healthcare workforce and the long-term care facilities, residents and workforce. We anticipate by the end of the month, all of those will be taken care of. And in some parts of the state, the healthcare workforce is actually taken care of already. The long-term care facilities were part of a federal pharmacy partnership that every state but West Virginia entered into. And we're working our best to move that faster, but it wasn't designed to be as nimble and fast as we would have designed it. So it's taking a little longer to get through those facilities. Three pharmacy chains at work all have their own skilled nursing facilities, assisted living and residential care facilities to get through for two doses of vaccine. They're using the Pfizer, which requires the most strict storage requirements. Um, that process is taking longer than we are comfortable with. We are, we are exerting pressure where we can. We're getting great cooperation from Kinney's in having a much more local focus, not as much so with the other chains. And with the healthcare workforce, we're getting great cooperation from our hospitals. A uh, little slow to start, but they have learned that we meant to really do business and they really have accelerated tremendously. So the reality of vaccine is we're getting eight to 9,000 doses a week. Totally unpredictable. We only know in the middle of one week what we'll get the next week and we don't know anything beyond that and it takes us to the middle of one week to get to the next week. Um, the governor and other governors were just in a meeting yesterday with the vice president and this administration on its way out the door is hoping to accelerate the amount of vaccine coming into states. 
feeding off of what the president-elect has already said, which is that they want that process to go much more robustly as well. We've been told that there's issues with manufacturing, but not so much. More issues with actually the quality control and letting the vaccine that's manufactured go through those processes. And then through Operation Warp Speed, they get sent out to the states. We could use a heck of a lot more than 8,000 doses a week, needless to say. And we will have the capacity to deliver to the population way more than that if we could only get our hands on it. So allocation uh, to the states is a core fundamental problem. The, the current administration has indicated that they will actually reward states that are getting vaccine into people's arms faster. And we are one of those states. Based on the CDC ratings, we're the second state with only Alaska uh, ahead of us. Based on other metrics, we're in the top seven states. Uh, for numbers of doses that came into the state being delivered to people. Uh, so that puts us in a good posture. If we say we can accommodate X number of doses, they need to do their best to give us that number of doses. And they will if they stick up to what their words are, because their words are, if you're one of the states that are higher performing, we'll get you more vaccine. So we shall see how that plays out. That's news just from yesterday, and God knows how it will evolve over the next uh, week of that administration's uh, existence. The um, allocation and distribution is one issue. The other issue is access to the vaccine. So certainly what we've been proposing and what we're assembling, and we are gonna say a lot about this at the Friday press conference, so I won't get too far out over my skis on this, is that first of all, regionally, um, there'll be access completely, not just at one hub here or one hub there. We need to worry about higher risk groups and making sure they have access in a uh, fair and equitable manner. We need to worry about homebound Vermonters who might not be able to go to a site to get vaccine and have it delivered to them, especially if they're in one of the highest risk groups as homebound Vermonters tend to be, either by age or by disease burden. And then we need to worry about those populations that have not fared as well with the virus uh, who we need to actually provide equitable access to like the BIPOC population. Um, and the BIPOC population is interesting because it's actually a bifurcated population. There's, if I could call it the more traditional BIPOC population, which I would regard as African-American, Hispanic, uh, and indigenous people in Vermont. And then there's the new American, as they're called. I'm not sure I'd like that term, but that population, which is tends to be younger, skews on the younger end, so by our traditional metrics of who's gonna do worse with the virus, well, being older, sicker people, they're not gonna qualify under that metric uh, like the more traditional population would. And we need to take that into consideration because they're just as important. And as we know from some of the outbreaks around the state, they have suffered disproportionately uh, from the virus thus far. So all of that is being taken into account, if I may put it that way. Um, the variables uh, are federal, as I mentioned, their manufacturer level, their number of platforms that vaccines are prepared with. Uh, right now we have Pfizer and Moderna. People are really getting optimistic about several other platforms getting approval end of January or into February. Some of them may have actually been part of the Operation Warp Speed where they've already been provided with funds by the federal government to have manufactured something that they never knew would come to fruition or not. So there'll be a, a little bit of a supply already available. And then the other variable would be uptake by the population. And I get asked even now, you know, how, how many people are refusing to take the vaccine? Don't have a really good handle on those stats this early in the game. We know that people in long-term care facilities are taking it at high rates if the consent process can be gotten through quickly enough. 
because uh, many of them are not in a position to provide that consent, so it needs to be family members. We know that the staff at long-term care is not so great. We know that healthcare workers in general, surveys have shown early in the game, 50% uptake, more recent surveys, 70 to 80%. Herd immunity is supposed to be somewhere between 70 and 90%. Nobody actually knows with this new virus. So, um, and, and we hear regionally different estimates of the percent of the healthcare workforce that's taken the vaccine. We also hear that many people in week one, two, and three said, no way. And now that they've seen their colleagues not drop dead uh, and still walk around the, the healthcare settings, uh, they're saying, oh, maybe I'll take it now. So they're coming in sort of as a laggard. They're not uh, early adopters on the uh, diffusion of innovation curve. Uh, so we'll see how that, uh, that kind of works out as well. Um, I don't know the general population in Vermont, what number that will be. One can predict that the older you are, the more likely you are to take the vaccine. That's been supported uh, by data from lots of other experiences in the past. Uh, but besides that, a little hard to tell. We always have a vaccine hesitant contingent in Vermont, like there is everywhere in the country and in the world. Um, hard to know how big that is. Often those are people that you can't actually convince to take a vaccine. And God forbid it be a novel vaccine, a new one from a novel virus, uh, because it's even true for the traditional vaccines for those individuals. But we don't think they amount for more than a certain small percent of the entire population. So we'll have to see how that plays out. We do believe distribution should be somewhat on a per capita basis. Um, acknowledging where people live and don't live in Vermont. So it should be equitable in that manner. Um, that's the way we've kind of done it with the healthcare workforce. Um, I'm not sure how successful we've been because uh, again, it's, it's all real-time data, really hard for us to tell. People always ask now about the priority groups and I'm gonna try to share my screen and if I can't do it, it's not the end of the world. Um, can anybody see a slide on there? Awesome. Hopefully just one slide. Yes. All right, and I'll even, uh, so some of this you've heard at press conferences. Now, did I just change things? Yes. How's that? Back to that slide. Okay, perfect. Um, we have three priorities in Vermont. And I would love to say that all three could be accomplished concurrently uh, without compromising one for the other. Priority one, which I'm gonna say first, is having less cases of COVID that lead to less hospitalizations and that lead to less deaths. So in a nutshell, priority one is saving lives, preventing more Vermonters from dying from this virus. Priority two, and I'm, you're gonna sense that I'm putting these in an order, but please don't accept this as a rank order. Um, priority two is keeping our kids in in-person instruction in school. And where they aren't yet in in-person instruction, making sure they get to that point. Because we know how much our educational system, our kids have suffered um, in uh, both hybrid environments and in worse. And priority three is of course, an economic priority um, to keep our economy thriving and uh, reopen as much of the business world as we can and have it go back to the way it once was, non-pandemic time. All I'm gonna say is our North Star right now is saving lives. And we, we're not mincing words about that at all. We're not saying that schools and teachers and workforces and businesses aren't important. We're just saying the preservation of life is what we've all chosen. And when I say we all, this is from the governor down and this is not just the Vermont Department of Health that we've all chosen as our North Star right now. So if you look at this slide, 
you'll see that every age band of five years has a case fatality rate associated with it. Case fatality rate means of all the people who get COVID in that age range, how many are dying? You can obviously see that the majority of deaths from COVID in our state occur in people over age 65. And, um, and certainly the older you get, the higher the risk gets. It's pretty clear from the data that if you're under age 65 and certainly under age 60, you have, I, I will say negligible, but that doesn't do justice to people who have had a poor outcome, but a negligible, statistically speaking, uh, risk of, of dying. Um, so that data has informed us tremendously about our approach to uh, the virus. Looked at another way uh, in terms of a heat map, you can see on the left March and on the right where we are now for dates, uh, all the deaths again are occurring in those age brackets um, in these very peak times of the introduction of the pandemic and now the sort of surge that's happened worldwide and certainly nationwide and regionwide. Um, it doesn't mean you have no risk if you're younger of dying, but you can see that the majority of our deaths have been in those older age brackets. And certainly 70% of our deaths have been in older people who are in long-term care facilities uh, as well. Many of them um, not necessarily uh, so sick that you would say that they were ready to die in their life, life, life cycle, um, but they, was just, they succumbed at a time of an outbreak. The purpose of this slide is to show that it's essentially somewhere between 35 and 50,000 people in each of those five year age bands. No matter what age you look at in the state of Vermont, that's how it breaks down. What it means is if you have a strategy of vaccinating everybody over 65 first to prevent deaths, you're already in the ballpark of 125,000 people. Now, having said that, some of them are in long-term care, but really there's only about 6,000 people total in, across long-term care settings. So um, that's negligible when you're looking at 125,000. So most of that 125,000 hasn't actually been taken care of yet. This slide just shows a little bit about um, who's high risk and what high risk means. So if you're high risk, which generally means age or having a chronic condition, which I'll get to in a second, you have um, a big chance to have a longer illness, a more severe illness, an illness associated with hospitalization, or God forbid, an illness associated with eventual death and succumbing to the disease. Um, probably something everybody kind of knew, but there's data to support that as well. And then lastly, today, our, we have a, uh, you know, we have the CDC with its advisory committee on immunization practice. And then in Vermont, we have our own advisory committee on immunization that's making suggestions to us all. Uh, they're looking at these chronic health conditions that are called high risk. A high risk health condition means if you have that condition and you get COVID, number one, you're probably more likely to get COVID because you had the condition. But number two, you're more likely to have a severe case of COVID. And obviously a severe case means hospitalization and or death. So most of these make a lot of sense. Emphysema, COPD, heart disease, kidney disease, cancer, or some other chronic immuno, immun, immunosuppressing illness or set of medications like for an organ transplant, something like that. Nobody's gonna argue with any of those, but also on this list from the CDC, is obesity and severe or morbid obesity. If you start saying we're gonna vaccinate just obese people, that's way too much of the Vermont population. Or, and God forbid, if you were in another state, it's really way too much of uh, the population. Uh, so there's questions if that should remain on the list. Likewise, smoking as a poor choice in lifestyle habits, but should that remain on the list 
um, compared to some of these other diseases. Pregnancy obviously would only involve a small number of people at any one time in Vermont. You know, we don't have that many births per year. That's one of our problems in Vermont, actually. Um, but at the same time, um, pregnancy is now recognized as a higher risk condition. And the OBGYN world uh, is doing a lot of shared decision-making with pregnant women, but it's erring on the side of vaccination more often than not. Um, so let's see. A few other issues on vaccine. And so I, I presented you know, this kind of data to you to show you why everything we've been messaging to date is talking about people who are older and people who have high risk conditions as the priority populations. If we do nothing else right with our vaccine protocols, we need to reach these populations sooner than later if we want less people dying in Vermont. So preservation of life is key. Um, just a couple other points to make. Um, phase 1A, of course, is the healthcare workers and long-term cares. The strategy is what I just said. That still leaves a lot of Vermonters who haven't yet received vaccines. So we will discuss those in a minute. Um, and uh, how long will those priority phases take to get through? Well, we do the math. If we got 125,000 people who are older, we have maybe another 100,000 who are younger than that, but have some of those high risk conditions. And you're getting 9,000 doses of vaccine a week. It's going to be short time by the time you, you get to the next population. I don't believe that's going to be the way it plays out because I do have optimism about these other vaccines being uh, approved. And I have optimism about the federal government revving up its rate of distribution and allocation of vaccine. But I'm just giving you the math as if it were today. Uh, that's a lot of weeks. Just to get through the 75 year and older, 50,000 people, you're talking six weeks. So if we started at the end of January, beginning of February, it would be March before we even got to people 70 to 74. Um, I think it's going to be faster because of the things I just said, my optimism. But everybody in the state, including people on this Zoom meeting, I'm sure, are saying, when can we get the vaccine? Because it's a very personal thing as well. If you believe in the vaccine and you see it as a potential pathway forward for yourself, um, you want to know when you're going to get it. And it takes some good forecasting to be able to tell people that. And we need much better transparency from uh, the federal government than we've gotten yet to, to help answer that. But you can tell that many of the we's are going to be not in the groups I just presented, and that's going to be many months down the road. <clears throat> Why should I trust the vaccine? Number one, because even though Operation Warp Speed is a cool Star Trek uh, kind of thing, and I'm a Star Trekker person, uh, I won't call myself a Trekkie. Um, the fact of the matter is the vaccine was not developed at warp speed, uh, cutting corners, uh, not paying attention to quality and performance measures, not gathering the right data, not looking at outcomes over a period of time. We can trust the vaccine. It's also a new platform. These two that are out, the messenger RNA platform, People are scared of that because it's never been used for another infectious disease. But it's not the first experience the scientific world has had with mRNA, and it won't be the last. And some of the other vaccine platforms actually are older technology, if I could call it that. <clears throat> and how will the vaccine impact getting back to normal? Um, here's where I always talk about the dual pathway, the fact that we have a vaccination pathway that hopefully gets us closer to herd immunity sometime in the future, but it's gonna be many, many months of masking, distancing, avoiding crowds, et cetera. All the guidance that you've been given ad nauseum is gonna to continue to be given well into the summer, possibly till the early fall, maybe later fall. We can't really pin it down just yet, 
but certainly for the winter and spring right now, uh, unless we continue to do all of that, people are going to get sick from COVID uh, because there's going to still be enough virus around. I truly believe what many pundits have said, every infection prevented does help lead to health and economic recovery. Um, it, it's just so clear. Uh, and look where we were in the summertime last year. Um, we really had done a great job of preventing a lot of infections. And though nobody on this call would say Vermont was economically where it always had been and on the ups, uptick, we certainly weren't as bad as things could have gotten. And when you look at some of the metrics that Commissioner Pichek and others in the financial world gather, we're one of the top states actually for getting back to a certain percent of our prior economic activity. It was in the 80s percents, which is actually uh, as good as it gets in this country. Um, and when you compare us to that actually said uh, we're just reopening. We don't care about the public health guidance. We're just going to reopen because we're sick and tired of this pandemic. They have not necessarily done better. They've done worse because they've had a significant public health crisis concurrent with trying to get out of their economic crisis. What does it take to achieve herd immunity? I've mentioned already the level being maybe in the 80s or 90% range. The how long it's going to take is uh, up for grabs, but you know, depending again on vaccine allocation, we have a dashboard that you should start to get familiar with because it's going to give you a good handle on how close we're getting to that goal right on the first page of that dashboard. Um, it's also going to depend on vaccine platforms and uptake as I've already alluded to. Um, I'll stop sharing right now and just make a few more comments. Um, so you've heard our priorities, you've seen the data, you understand there's a dashboard. Another question is, why aren't we going strictly by CDC? Well, I'm not announcing exactly, exactly where we're going because we're going to announce that Friday, but let's do a hypothetical here. CDC and its um, current guidance lumps together, get everybody old done, get everybody with chronic disease done, do the so-called frontline essential workers, however you define that. If, if we can make one promise to one another, we should eliminate the term essential worker from our lexicon. Because if you really look at what an essential worker is, 80 plus percent of people who work in Vermont would be considered an essential worker. And even if they weren't, they would make a case to you that they were and convince you um, because that's how that term gets used. So there you are, you have a, a vaccine protocol that essentially takes into account 80% of the population, but they all have to get it as the priority uh, right up front. Then there are others who I call frontline workers and I prefer that term a lot more. There are the frontline workers who have patient contact, which are already taken care of in 1A. And then there are frontline workers, like people who work in the grocery store, people who work one-on-one -on -one in a uh, hair salon, or people who work in schools, uh, who are all frontline workers. Um, and how do you do all of that at one time, which is essentially what CDC uh, guidance would have you do. I think we should try to disappoint the least number of people we can at any one time. And if the expectations are that every group is a priority, every group will be disappointed. Because I already told you, if we just focused on the 75 and older, it's gonna take us six weeks. Well, if we did that in the same time frame as focusing on all these other groups, it's gonna take six years. Um, and, the, and the amount of people in each group that gets a vaccine is gonna be minuscule. And they're all gonna be disappointed that they can't even register and get an appointment for it. So Governor Scott is a person who I respect tremendously for his understanding of what a Vermonter would think. Uh, he has the ability to get his head into the minds of Vermonters and express what they really think. He thinks, and I believe that simplicity is important when you embark on a complex pro pro program of mass vaccination of a whole population. This has never been done anywhere, never mind in Vermont. 
Uh, so simplicity, feasibility. Um, I would also use the word pragmatism. I would also use the word uh, respecting prioritization, but taking it only as far as one can go and tempering expectations from the start and making sure that people understand where they will fall in line so that they don't feel they've been forgotten from the outset. So some of this does require people to accept that saving lives is indeed as noble a cause as we say it is, and that it is using public health data to drive policy. Uh, and I'm certainly telling you all of that. Um, and that's sort of the way this is playing out, but it can only disappoint a lot of people, even without telling them they're included in the first group, but certainly telling them they're not included in the first group. Um, if we get into a point of much grander vaccine allocation and distribution, this will become so much easier. Uh, assuming we have the setup to allow people to access the vaccine in the state. So what is all of our future planning? Well, it's really current planning. It's really, where will vaccines be delivered? So some vaccines will be delivered traditionally through the healthcare system, just like everybody imagines. However, think about this Pfizer vaccine that is 70 below zero. You can't just expect a primary care practice to have a freezer for that and have the need to deliver 975 doses of it all at once because that's what you have to do with that vaccine. Larger healthcare systems or regional healthcare systems can actually use a central location that can deliver the vaccine through their system, but not at the site of a primary care practice. So that the primary care practices often of which will have the same healthcare records, um, electronic records as the ones uh, in their region, will be able to join together and be delivered vaccine from the healthcare system through there. However, I don't think that's the most efficient way to do it. But if you think about many of our uh, sickest and or oldest Vermonters, that is how they will feel most comfortable accessing the vaccine and having those conversations with their healthcare provider. A second way is the way we've done it for years and years through pharmacies. And pharmacies actually do wanna play a role in this. And there's no reason why they should not be allowed to play a role in this. Um, and they can be a point of access as well. We also have our district health offices, which are called pods, points of distribution which have the capacity to deliver a lot of vaccine, especially to Vermonters who have no insurance, uh, but to anybody really. Um, and that's a pre-existing framework. But building on that framework, we envision that we will have larger sites that these healthcare district offices will operate out of. It won't be operating out of their district office where they have like five parking spaces. Uh, they'll be in a larger setting, whether it's in a mall, whether it's in a Champlain Valley Fairground, whether it's in a, another large um, setting that you can line a lot of people up, have a big parking lot, et cetera. We uh, have identified a whole bunch of those in different regions of the state. Those will be sites of what we'll call community vaccination. But it can't be chaos. If you've been watching the news, there are 90 year olds with walkers lining up in Florida in the middle of the night to be first in line for 11 o'clock in the morning when the place opens up and get throughput. Uh, I don't think we're gonna do that in January in Vermont or February or March. Um, there are other places where the registration systems are crashing left and right. I can't pretend that ours wouldn't either, but people are being very thoughtful about that. What we envision though, is having a registration system and having people be educated about where they can access the uh, site that they wanna access their vaccine in and get themselves uh, in the queue, so to speak, for that to happen. We also wanna make sure that whatever system occurs is not one that allows wastage of this valuable scarce resource. Um, people are already asking, well, 
some of the hospitals are running out of healthcare workers to vaccinate. We want them to be able to smoothly transition into the 75 year old group, uh, not just say February 1st, 75 or older, you start then. We risk having the unused vaccine or God forbid wasted vaccine uh, for a week before that. So hopefully everything that goes on from this point forward will have a transition period as well, where as you come to the end of one cycle and you'll see the appointments diminishing and the demand diminishing for that cycle, you rev up for the next cycle and allow people to start coming in. Um, so smooth transitions is really important. And then the other factor of course is safety. God forbid we have anaphylactic reactions in multiple places. We haven't seen much of that. We've seen a couple cases and some people have had to be transported to an emergency department. So we need to make sure that every vaccine site has the capacity to manage somebody who gets a severe allergic reaction, uh, whether it just requires an EpiPen, whether it requires somebody to be transferred to an ER, uh, make sure that we're not having people sitting in cars, getting somebody through the window, vaccinate them, having them go park out in a field, and then 20 minutes later, they're unconscious. Uh, we've got to have a, a strategy that allows for safety to make sure that that is factored in. A little easier with the test sites, the mass testing sites, because people don't die from getting their nose uh, probed with a swab to get tested. Uh, vaccines are a different proposition. So I think I've covered a bunch of the things that I was asked to cover. Um, some of them more superficially than you would like, some of them maybe more deeply than I should have been allowed to. Uh, and uh, this might be a good place to stop. And uh, hear from you. Uh, <clears throat> Commissioner Levine, thank you. Thank you very much for also uh, focusing so specifically on vaccine distribution, because um, I know that that was, uh, that is a very, uh, that's a very current uh, concern um, and need for information. Um, I, I guess I would, I would, want to begin um, before I ask if any, for people to, to raise their hand with questions. Um, Commissioner Levine, I believe you, there is a web page. Where should people, um, where should we be as legislators directing our constituents um, to ever changing information about vaccines? Yeah. So. Everybody's familiar with just the COVID part of our website. You know, you go to the VDH healthvermont.gov and go to COVID-19. And then you can automatically within the COVID-19 part of the website, go to the vaccine pages. And within those, you can actually go to the dashboard page, the public facing dashboard, which will give you a sense of how many doses of vaccine have been delivered to people thus far. Thank you. And as I said, we're one of the best states, even though the number won't look very impressive when you look at it. Um, thank you. Um, right now we have three questions on deck. We have Senator Lyons, we have um, to go first, and then we have um, uh, Representative Small and Senator Hardy. I can only keep three at once. Um, so in that order, um, and then we will continue. And there's a chat box too. I'm, I haven't really been keeping up with it because I've been talking. But. Um, I am hoping that the people who wrote on the chat box will raise their hand because sometimes questions evolved and might have gotten answered. Um, Senator Lyons. Uh, so thank you. And thank you so much for a comprehensive uh, overview of what's happened and where we're going. Um, and I think we all get it, I, I really do. I, I guess the, the, the question that is, is never answered adequately for, any, for some of our teachers and educators is how come? You know, how come we haven't been prioritized? And I think it would be extremely helpful if you could um, address that question. And then the other question I have is I hear, I hear the comment about 
staff needs and, and needing folks who are available to do testing or vaccinations or other, um, other uh, services. So if you could address each of those, that would be extremely helpful. Thank you. Yeah, and you know, publicly we're gonna to have to stay stuff this Friday about uh, many of the things I've talked about. Um, and God forbid any teacher in the state think that we don't value what they do and we don't think they're important um, and, and respect what they've done and sacrificed for to date. Um, but again, in, in a policy of trying not to set unrealistic expectations for a scarce resource, um, there are harsh realities, which are unfortunate. I do know there are states that are trying to do everything at once. And I don't know how you know, they can possibly uh, create any sense of real expectations that are um, practical, as well as realistic uh, for anybody who falls in the categories that they're vaccinating. And then we just heard uh, from um, Health and Human Services in Washington yesterday that they just think everybody over 65 should be vaccinated. Well, we do too, but can we just do that? That's basically saying we're gonna try to vaccinate 120,000 plus people in Vermont all at once, as quickly as we can. And that's gonna create unrealistic expectations and disappointments as well. So this is sort of what we're in now. The only thing that will help it will be better allocation of vaccine to the state and the state being prepared, no matter what number of doses come in to be able to deliver those very expeditiously. And indeed, uh, that is our goal. Uh, and um, one thing, you know, we've done throughout the pandemic is tried to be the number one state in as many of the good parts of managing the pandemic as we can. So that will certainly stretch to vaccination as well. Uh, we want to be up there in the top states that are doing a good job doing this so that people who are teachers or in other frontline work will appreciate that maybe we'll get to them faster than uh, anyone would have imagined. Can you, can you briefly uh, talk about the um, transmission of COVID uh, for the younger, uh, younger age, you know, yeah. kids so, versus adults and so on. I think that is also very um, illuminating. It is very illuminating. So, you know, we spent a lot of time and worked in a very multi-component uh, team that had pediatricians, pediatric infectious disease, public health, school nurses, um, educators, obviously, a huge team, all looking at what would it be like to get kids back into in-school, in-person instruction. And we looked at world data, we looked at some emerging US data, though there wasn't enough of it. And the vast consensus was that younger kids, and we'll call that age 11 and younger, K through six-ish, K through five, K through six, um, really don't appear to get the virus as often and certainly don't seem to be vectors of the virus to the adult population. Now, part of that is biologic, and we believe it has to do with these ACE, ACE receptors that are in the nasal and oral mucosa uh, and the development of those receptors with age over time and the lack of expression of a lot of that in the younger kids. But the data, even in Vermont, supports what we saw around the world, which is that we're not seeing abundant cases of virus transmitted within schools from kids to the adult population. More often we're seeing either a kid with a case acquired in their household where there were other cases or an adult who works in the school becoming a case and having to go home and isolate uh, because like anybody who goes to any work site, they happen to bring it to the school. 
We've had a number of times when schools have had to cancel classes or close the school, but none of those times have really been because they had virus being transmitted within the school. It's because they had adult contacts of cases in sufficient numbers that they couldn't operate the school. So if they had one or two people in the adult community at the school who had the virus, they would then have a number of people who were contacts of those people who had to quarantine. And they had to say for staffing considerations, we need to go remote. And that's what they did. In this later part of the surge that we're having right now, we are seeing more cases in schools like we are in every work site in the, in the state. But even those are again, a couple cases here, a couple cases there, a student here, an adult there, and they're not causing major uh, trauma, if I could say, with what's going on in the school in terms of keeping the kids in the kind of learning environment that they've been in. Certainly isn't helping us open up more schools from hybrid to more in-person, but that will come with time. Uh, but clearly it's not setting us backwards either, which is important. So again, uh, teachers make a good point. They are frontline and they are working with kids all the time. Um, but the fact of the matter is when we do surveillance testing in the school population, we find out that the teachers have an infinitesimally small positivity rate in the 0.25% range compared to what our current state rate is, which is 2.5%. Uh, and that's just testimony to how careful the school teachers and other workforce in the schools have been uh, trying to preserve education for their kids. And I would love to be able to reward them for that, move them to the front of the line, uh, but we got to get through this higher priority, as I said, of saving lives first. And certainly we're not seeing tremendous amounts of cases in schools that are evolving into severe outcomes uh, in any way. Did that answer the question? Thank you. Thank you, um, Commissioner. We um, then have questions from um, Representative Small and Senator Hardy, followed by um, Representative Corbis. And I have the other three of you as well. Representative Small. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Dr. Levine, for your thorough explanations today. I know you touched on this briefly when thinking about our new American families. And I was wondering what the plan was in the vaccine rollout, especially when we're thinking about the diversity of age brackets and risk factors among those families um, and wondering what the plan is from your perspective. Yeah, very timely time to ask this question. Um, I'm not gonna give you the answer. I'm gonna lay out the issues um, because we have a lot of people working on the answer. Uh, we have our own health department, uh, health equity team. We have members embedded in the Winooski uh, weekly meetings that occur amongst the new American communities and their advocates there, along with uh, city government. We have uh, Susanna Davis's racial equity task force and Susanna as the lead of that. We have what we call cultural brokers um, that Dr. Avila from the medical center and others have worked closely with uh, in their development. Uh, so we have a lot of input coming in. Here are the uh, basic issues. Number one, BIPOC, depending on what time in the epidemic you look at it, had a three to four times rate of cases compared to non-BIPOC uh, Vermonters. Uh, so more susceptible to the virus and uh, a higher rate of uh, hospitalizations. Thank God, not a higher rate of death, but that's because most of the time our deaths have been few in number and uh, there's nothing statistically significant about death in that population. Um, I kind of look at the uh, BIPOC community in two ways. Um, and I think it's in an informed way. There's the more traditional way of looking at it, which is uh, African-American, Hispanic, and parts of our indigenous people in Vermont uh, who have been here in America for generations. They tend to skew a bit older and uh, fit some of the other criteria for risk for severe illness. Then we have the, what I, I have, 
been instructed to call the new American community, and I'm still not comfortable with that term, um, but we all know who I'm talking about, people who have specifically come here often as refugees from very dire circumstances and are now living amongst us in Vermont um, and uh, hopefully thriving. That tends to skew to a much younger population. Um, and the households are often filled with young children, younger uh, parents, occasionally an elder like a matriarch or patriarch who came with them, uh, but not, not universally. And often living in congregate settings and in multi-household arrangements, which are of course by themselves risk factors for COVID, even if you're completely healthy and young. So, uh, there are a little bit differences in risk and needs for both of those sort of sides of the population. In addition, if we truly re recognize uh, the construct of racism, of historical injustice, of uh, inequities that have persevered over time, uh, we all know that um, we need to remedy much of that. That can't be done in one fell swoop overnight. That takes a long time. Um, but part of that process is becoming alert to it and actually factoring it in when you do something like try to vaccinate every Vermonter. So there we have the sort of dual vying strategies of one, let's prioritize everybody in this community because they have shown worse outcomes and they need to be at the front of the line. Well, some might say, of course, that's what you do. Others might say, that doesn't show that you're truly informed about this historical aspect to their experience. And indeed, haven't thought about things like the Tuskegee experiments and things of that sort, where moving you to the front of the line actually makes it look like you're part of an experiment um, and you're dispensable as opposed to you really are the priority. Um, that's a delicate kind of issue, but it's not one that we can just ignore. Another way to look at prioritization is, we may not say you're the front of the line and you know in front of everybody in the state, but when your bracket comes up, we're gonna do our darndest to make sure that we have educated you well, that the messaging has been clear, that interpretation services uh, are available so that you understand everything about this vaccine, and most importantly, you may have access needs that other Vermonters don't have, and we're gonna make sure we prioritize your access to the vaccine. So that may mean setting up a clinic in a place that actually you can access and don't have to drive somewhere to, and you don't even have a car, or a place where you don't have to take mass transit to and put yourself at more risk for being uh, with other people who could give you COVID. So everything I've just thrown at you is being looked at as part of a big picture. And I can't tell you uh, the final pathway of how it's gonna look, but I'm hoping this week that we will actually arrive at that. But I wanted you to be sensitive to uh, all the things we're trying to be sensitive to, all the data, all the aspects of history and all the aspects of what their current reality is, lived reality. So that's where we are with BIPOC. Um, and there's no way we cannot ass uh, assign some sense of priority to the population. That's just a matter of how we do it and how we fulfill the expectations that we should fulfill. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Levine. Um, thank you, Dr. Levine. And we have um, Senator Hardy and after Senator Hardy, we have um, four more people and we have uh, give or take about 15 minutes. So um, Senator Har um, Harvey, then Representative Cordes, Mc uh, Representative McFawn, Representative Patterson and Senator Hooker. Thank you, Representative Pugh. And um, thank you, Dr. Levine. It's really good to see you. Um, and thank you to all of your staff. They've been amazing um, and just incredible work that you're doing. So thank you on behalf of all Vermonters. Um, I have a, a few questions. I'm gonna just list them all and then let you take it from there. Um, I appreciate your um, 
comments about long-term care facilities. I've been in touch with Commissioner Hutt about this. This is a particular concern of mine right now because as you said, the, the rollout to long-term care facilities has been slow. It sounds like a lot of it is beyond your control, unfortunately. But I'm wondering if you have explored any possibilities of, uh, of taking control because you're doing a better job at it than the feds are. Um, so that's, they're just, they're people in these facilities that have been in isolation and that are, you know, have all these other impacts on them for and on 10 going on 10 months. And so I, I just wondered if you could speak a little bit more to that. Um, the second thing is um, in terms of schools, um, I, I echo the question that Senator Lyons asked, um, but I'm wondering digging deeper, um, and there was a little bit in the chat about this, there are certain um, staff members in our schools that um, are essentially healthcare workers, frontline healthcare workers in the, the jobs that they're doing, uh, school nurses in particular, some paraeducators and special educators, um, and some counselors in schools. And I'm wondering if they are included in the A1 category um, and are getting vaccinated now. Um, I spent my off session uh, uh, as a substitute in our in a school, and I, I see the work that they're doing on the front lines that is the equivalent of healthcare workers. And I'm wondering if they could potentially be included in this first list. And then my last question, and then I'll let you take it away, is I'm getting a lot of questions, as I'm sure we all are, about when it is my turn, how do I sign up for a vaccine? Will there be some kind of online system like we have with testing? Um, and what is the plan for the sort of logistics of signing up for your vaccination? Thank you. Great. And I, I can be briefer with these answers on these two. With the long-term care, we have exerted some pressure that's worked with one of the three pharmacy chains very well. The other two, not so great. Uh, we've explored having some of our hospital systems deliver some of the vaccine and they've had some enthusiasm. The problem is we don't wanna screw up the entire system because the way the vaccine comes into the state as part of this federal pharmacy program is pretty programmed and um, we don't want to disrupt it in a way that will interrupt second doses or will interrupt even getting the first doses to the right places that haven't gotten them yet. Because these pharmacies have schedules set up over the ensuing weeks. It's just we'd like them to speed up those schedules. So we have not abandoned looking at it, but we are being more cautious because of the fact we don't want to screw it up. Um, second thing about the schools, school nurses were clearly in 1A. 1A, we've tried to message the fact that it's patient facing. Now, I know that that can be interpreted broadly too, because I've heard from plenty of teachers, even my daughter who is in another state, but has cleaned up her share of vomitus on the floor and on a student's clothes um, in the second grade. Um, so does that make her a healthcare worker? Um, you know, most people in their own businesses and whatever don't have to go to that extreme and do that, but teachers do. You mentioned paraeducators who may be exposed to a higher risk population as well. Um, right now, the definition is not included in healthcare workers. We've tried to be fairly strict and specific about that patient facing and patient being truly a patient, not a sporadic kid who gets sick uh, and comes to school uh, ill. Um, I, I know that's not gonna be super popular, but that's kind of how the line has had to be drawn just to be effective in messaging how that works. Thirdly, um, there's going to be a registration system and the date for that is later this month I won't give you a precise date because then I'd have to be held to it. And uh, I'm not part of the uh, ADS part of government. Uh, they will hold the, themselves to the date, but that will have a very simple program because there's gonna be some questions that have to be asked that allow people to know if they should just go get their vaccine or if there's some steps in between in terms of getting a physician's uh, decision-making involved 
uh, allergy issues, things of that sort. Um, there'll be the basic demographic stuff they have to input, which will be very straightforward. Um, and then there'll be, but depending on where they are in the state, where their options are for getting the vaccine and where appointments are for those options. We know that some of the people who are in the older age strata will probably want to use the telephone more than the uh, technology, not to be totally uh, stereotypical about this because there's plenty that are well-versed, but we know from other systems that experience tells that many will want to use the telephone. So we're going to have to have a uh, apparatus and we're already contracting with other firms to make sure that that's available as well. So if people need help with registration, they can just do that. They have to still know that it's time for them to do it though. And that's gonna be you know, through the press conferences, through mass media, through social media. Uh, there'll be a lot of ways to let the population know that their turn is up, uh, whether it's an age-based or another basis. So I'm hoping that will go smoothly. Uh, I've never seen anything in the IT world go as smoothly as it was advertised. So I make no promises, but at the same time, a lot of good effort is going into this and we'll need to have some faith. Thank you. Um, I just hope that if, if you're not able to um, vaccinate people in school buildings that you are cautious about your plans to try to get all the students back into the school buildings. I think that's going to be really tough if you're not able to do more vaccinations for our teachers and frontline workers in schools. Yeah. And, and, and just to make one other quick point, I think you're all aware, but the two vaccines that we're using right now, the cutoff age is 16 and 18. So we're not even able to vaccinate the students that the teachers are concerned about uh, because we don't have a vaccine that's been authorized for use in the child population yet. I'm hoping that will change, but so far that's what it is. Um, we now have um, about 10 minutes left. Um, so uh, Representative Cordes followed by um, hopefully Representative McFawn and Representative Peterson and Senator Hooker. Might I suggest that the, those of you at the end that you put your question in the chat and we'll then send it to him if we don't have time. Representative Cordes. Thank you. And Commissioner, it's good to see you speaking as a healthcare colleague and a legislator. Uh, Senator Hardy asked my question about uh, the frontline educators that work closely with um, kids toileting, et cetera. Um, so my next question is a comment um, and maybe a consideration for us legislators um, in that we may be able to help with this issue. I volunteered um, at UVM Medical Center to assist with uh, immunizing people um, and was told that I couldn't because it would be putting me in overtime. So I would like to advocate for um, the ranks of volunteers, I don't need to get paid for it. Um, I would like to be able to get my colleagues who um, are licensed and skilled at offering immunizations and working with the state um, to help um, get the shots in arms, so to speak, as quickly as possible. And indeed, we have this entire entity called the Medical Reserve Corps, the MRC. Um, where a number of people have come forward already and, and had that same thought. I think we're integrating that into our planning process, but I'm gonna to have to uh, check in on that later today during our vaccine meeting. Uh, but wonderful suggestion. And I agree there's plenty of people that wanna volunteer, they don't wanna get paid to be part of the vaccination force. Thank you. You're on mute, Representative Pugh. Representative McFawn, a question? Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Dr. Levine, for being here. Um, question is, if staff in the healthcare and long-term care facilities uh, are refusing the vaccine, how are the patients and residents of those facilities 
being protected against the virus until they develop uh, sufficient immunity. That's question one. Question two is you're getting eight to 9,000 doses a week. How many shots are actually being given out? Thank you. Good, so thus far we've given out over 25,000 first shots plus a I number mean, of seconds. Yeah, you I know, I'm week. just saying, yeah, total 25,000 uh, over several weeks. Um, I believe, uh, I'm not sure I can give you the number per week. I can give you the percentage of the, sh of the vaccine that came into the state, how much we delivered to people. And the highest number we have was last week, which was 58%. Now you may go, well, gee, can't you do better than that? But realize 58% takes into account what you're getting in, what you have to plan to allocate at a future date. If it comes in on a Wednesday, which it does quite frequently, the healthcare system has to set up clinics based on when it came in so that they can deliver it. So they're gonna set up a clinic for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, even though they wanted to do it Monday through Friday, but it didn't come in till Wednesday. Then you've got the pharmacy partners who have scheduled their long-term cares out for three weeks and have them sort of rationed in a way so they have enough vaccine for all of them. 58% is actually remarkable if you look at it from the way I've just described. That was gonna be very different than the subsequent phases where we're no longer dependent on the federal pharmacy partnership. We're not totally dependent on the hospitals and the healthcare system. And we can basically get the vaccine to where it needs to get to, uh, to keep up with the appointments that have already been set up in those locations. So we should be able to do way better than that. Certainly in the 80s to 90%, knowing you'll always have to be withholding some vaccine just as part of your planning allocation for the, the subsequent week. It also gets complicated when it comes to second doses, but I won't even burden you with that right now. With regard to your first question, the long-term cares are totally dependent on everybody who works there doing everything they're supposed to do in terms of masking and um, being uh, in society respectful of all the public health guidance. Obviously they can't distance from the patients they're working with, uh, but they can do the distancing in their community. So the best thing we can do for the long-term care facilities or for your corner grocery store or anywhere else is to reduce the amount of virus in our communities right now. And the only way to do that is these dual pathways of all the right behaviors from a public health standpoint, and vaccinating more and more of the population. So that's how, that's the simple answer to the dilemma you provide. You didn't ask me, but many ask, well, can't the places uh, mandate that their employees get the vaccine? But right now, uh, and I know David is on from a legal point of view, but this will be a, an important legal question for the world to be looking at in the future. Uh, a lot of employers of various sorts will want to mandate their employees have the vaccine. But at the same time, the commissioner of the FDA has told us very clearly, these vaccines haven't actually been approved in that sense. They've all achieved the EUA, emergency use authorization. Emergency use authorization is not synonymous with uh, approval. Only an approved FDA medication or treatment or procedure can be uh, mandated by someone. This is not at that level yet. So that's the answer to that question. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Representative Patterson and then Senator Hooker. Peters, Representative Peterson. Oh, okay. I, I didn't quite get to, sorry, Madam Speaker. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Levine, for a very informative presentation. Um, you mentioned that uh, we would get, or we're getting eight to 9,000 doses a week. And you said we could do way better than that, or we could use way more than that. Uh, how, ma how many could we, how, how many doses could we distribute right now? if it's more than the eight to 9,000? 
Yeah, that's a challenge because we don't yet have these community sites officially set up yet. That will be another week or so. So uh, I don't want to get ahead of that. But clearly the hospitals have already told us uh, in many cases that they could administer more than they've been getting right now because they're getting it on a per capita basis as well. And many of them have exhausted the healthcare workforce so they can actually move into the 75 year old band pretty quickly. Um, so, you know, I, I would certainly say that would be in the thousands of doses across the state. So if I were so bold to say, if we had doubled the allocation, we would find a way to get that in, I'm sure. And that's okay. indeed what we're planning for, you know, even more than that someday. But right now, you know, just through our district health offices uh, uh, throughout the state alone, we could deliver 7,000 doses in a week. Uh, we're not even utilizing those right now. So that gives you an idea that we could go way higher. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Levine, I am amazed and very, very grateful that you and your staff haven't succumbed to COVID fatigue and <laughs> uh, we'll, we're all benefiting from that. Uh, to direct the conversation away from vaccines for a second, I'm curious to know how contact tracing is going in the department. Have things um, been going well and, and continue to go well? Yes. Yeah, so a number of weeks ago, we markedly enhanced the workforce in that arena. Uh, we're capable of uh, contact tracing way over 300 cases a day now. God forbid we get near that number. Uh, we've been in an average of 160 over the last several weeks. Last night, I think the count was in the 100 teens, which uh, I'd love to see that trend continue if that will happen, but that's not a trend yet. Um, so um, the contact tracing workforce is actually certainly more than adequate to the task right now. And when we look at our turnaround time, meaning connecting with a case or connecting with contacts within a 48 hour period, it's certainly in the 80s to 90s percents that are being uh, connected with. And often when they're not connected with, it's because we just can't find the person on the other end of the line, not because we haven't tried. So uh, I'm, I'm not just trying to present a rosy tale here. We actually have really bolstered the workforce and um, though many are new, they've come online and are doing a great job. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, committees. Uh, I'm somewhat amazed. Um, we have four minutes. And so in that four minutes, I want to turn it over to um, Senator Lyons or Representative Lippert if they have any final comments or um and I just want to again say, Commissioner, please thank your staff uh, for all their work. Senator Lyons and then Senator uh, Representative Lippert. So uh, simply thank you. Uh, thank you for your continued efforts. Uh, your work keeps us from having COVID fatigue and we greatly appreciate what you're doing. Yes, uh, Dr. Levine, likewise. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I, would, I would simply also say that uh, I believe that we, as the healthcare committees of the legislature, will remain very receptive to updates from you. Uh, and also, um, frankly, uh, information as to what we can do to support you and the health department, uh, who I know have to be beyond COVID fatigue. Uh, if, and from what we hear directly and sometimes indirectly, uh, the level of uh, stress on your staff, and I can't imagine on you personally, but uh, let me say that do not be shy. Uh, I speak for myself at this point, but I believe for others, do not be shy in bringing forward a clear message to us as to what we can provide to the you and the health department to protect Vermonters so that you can continue to succeed as you have been so dramatically. I, 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 want, I, do, I do not want to learn 
that there was something we could do that we did not realize that we could do to support you and your department. So thank you. And again, thank you. I thank you all for your very kind comments and I will convey them to the uh, remainder of the department as well. Um, and uh, as you've alluded to, it does take a village. Yes. Uh, we have a pretty large village within the department, but it also takes a large village across state government um, through the, all the branches of state government, to be quite honest. Um, and certainly uh, there are many on the governor's team um, that have been very instrumental in, in supporting the kind of success we have here. And I, I said in my opening comments about having a population that is really focused on health and wants the best outcomes in health. Well, it's always important that that population be supported by a government that wants the best health and wants the best outcomes in health. And in that sense, uh, we've got a great rich tradition that we built on and are continuing. So thank you all. Okay. Thank you. And uh, th this ends the joint meeting with uh, House Human Services, House Health and Welfare and Senate, you know, House Healthcare and Senate Health and Welfare on uh, Wednesday, January 13th, with the focus on the uh, COVID and vaccines with uh, Commissioner Levine.